So today we're thrilled to have Tori O'Dell from the Rural Mental Health Project. She's going to share about the programs available uh, through their organization and answer any questions you have. And so I will now turn things over to Tori. Thanks, Lindsay. And hi, everybody. As Lindsay shared, my name is Tori O'Dell. I am a network specialist with the Rural Mental Health Project and Network. And like Lindsay mentioned, I'm just going to do a somewhat brief overview of what our project and network is, why it was developed, how it was developed, and what um, our main goals are overall to support rural communities with mental health and well-being, um, and then how you can also get involved if you wish. Um, at the end, I will provide uh, my contact information as well in case you do want to get involved. So we are the Rural Mental Health Project and Network. And so why does rural mental health need further specialized attention? Basically, why was our project ever even developed? So over the past seven years, we've continued gaining a deeper understanding of the unique strengths and challenges surrounding rural communities' mental health. There's been many articles, reports, and scans that confirm what rural Albertans have expressed in our discussions throughout the province with them. We know that mental health, mental disorders and challenges are rising, and in rural areas, there are specific difficulties in accessing services and interventions for mental illness and addiction issues due to the scarcity, cost, and limited travel options. And this has led to poorer effectiveness due to the lack of long-term follow-up, and then in the unfortunate circumstances when residents do have to leave their communities to access services, they often lose access to their positive supports and struggles and struggle to return home, which can then accelerate other issues like isolation and homelessness. Most rural communities express the need for local service providers. However, small populations can struggle to keep these professionals, as I'm sure we are well aware because we're here with RPAP. <laughs> um, and this can make permanent in-person services economically or practically unviable. And so for years, rural communities have had experts parachute in with solutions that were developed and tested for urban centers, which, as I'm sure, again, many of us are very familiar with, are not always practical or relevant to the context of the rural communities that we're living in. And this has led to an erosion of trust as local expertise and perspectives are ignored or the solutions do not consider local values, history, and issues. And so this has led to many initiatives that are short-lived and less impactful than intended. So what are we doing to advance better rural community well-being? So the Rural Mental Health Network is a project under the Canadian Mental Health Association Alberta Division, and we recently just went through a merger, so now we are also home of the Centre for Suicide Prevention. Um, and the focus of CMHA Alberta is on strengthening community capacity for better, better mental health. And so what that means is we focus on upstream approaches. This includes health promotion, community development, as well as advocacy. We also ensure the voices of lived and living experiences are embedded in the design and implementation of what we do. And we're not clinicians that de deliver treatment services or programs. It's not within our scope, but we do partner with other organizations and agencies that do provide that. Our rural community partners shaped our approach and how we implemented it in communities. And their recommendations included supporting socially innovative and community-based approaches that build positive mental health and recovery and are anchored to community priorities. So not necessarily what the overall idea of, you know, this is what we need to do to improve mental health as a global province, but what does this specific community need, want, enjoy, and how can we use those and strengthen those to improve the community well-being? And so together that emphasizes um, that there are many factors that impact well-being and they vary from community to community, which does include treatment services, but it does also go beyond those treatment services like therapy, et cetera. So honoring the recommendations and guidance we've received, our approach recognizes that rural mental health is a complex issue. Rural communities are unique. No one community is the same as the other, and so there is no one-size-fits-all approach that can address the unique challenges in each community. Instead, complex solutions are needed that are flexible to the unique circumstances across communities. 
And so therefore, our approach is principle driven, and this helps us recognize and respond to the unique context of each community. So our evidence informed principles include recognizing that mental health is more than the absent absence of mental illness. So whole communities, whole people, it's not just about like a specific diagnosis by um, necessarily. So the wheel may, may look this wheel may look familiar to some of you as it was adapted and informed by the social determinants of health. And so for those that aren't familiar with the social determinants of health, um, the social determinant, de determinants of health and what we call our eight domains recognizes that there are multiple interacting factors within ourselves and our communities that shape our mental health, such as our cultural experiences and values, feelings of safety and belonging, access to food and other basic needs, and the economic, social, and natural environments that we live in. Services um, are included, but as you can see, they're just one piece of the pie that is um, the whole pie of personal or community well-being. And so we encourage local actions that weave across multiple areas of health to find opportunities for change and innovation. Our next principle is strength-based. And so being strength-based is not about being naive about gaps, but recognizing that sometimes when we focus only on the deficits or the community's problems or lack of services, et cetera, it's not always helpful. And it can often cause people to feel discouraged or angry or honestly just like hopeless about the next steps. So when we bring attention to the great people and great work already taking place in communities, it helps reframe the conversation um, and what is possible. It helps change mindsets. It changes perspectives. And people have more of a hopeful thought process when it comes to these really big, complex issues. Um, and so finding and strengthening connections across local and regional assets shift us away from we don't the we don't have anything mentality towards taking actions from a place of pride, hope and creativity. And then our next project principle is collaboration and community based. We know that health and recovery do not happen in isolation, but often that is the root of practice for many communities. By inviting citizens into leadership spaces and working across sectors, communities can develop actions that are respectful and inclusive of the diverse experiences and expertise of their community members. The collaborative process strengthens connection, belonging, and feelings of safety. And this can lead to more resilient solutions, as well as more resilient communities and individuals, because there's skill development happening um, among those that are participating. And then our final principle is that it's developmental. So just like people, communities change over time. We can't and don't stay the same, and neither can our approach. We need to continually adjust our actions as new information comes to light. And so aligning with the evidence, principles, and rural recommendations, our goals are to support a healthier rural Alberta. So first, to inspire locally driven collaborative and strength-based action plans that advance community health. Um, and second, to offer ongoing provincial-led support and connections while improving awareness, collaboration, and coordination across allies. And so, I apologize, I messed up my slides there. Um, so our, our approach includes three main pillars of action that weave together. So our first pillar is that we build capacity within rural communities to start or expand local action teams. And we do this by providing training and funding to a local resident, um, a passionate community member who we call an animator. And this is one of my favorite parts because everyone's always like, why is it called an animator? Do we draw? And then we always laugh. Um, but when you look at the definition of an animator, it means bringing something to life. And so that's why we chose the term animator. Basically, these animators are going to take training, they're going to learn skills around facilitation, asset based community development, and then they're able to engage and bring their community together to develop collective action plans, and then bring those action plans to life. So I always just think it's really lovely to kind of explain the meaning behind that um, title, because I know it can be kind of confusing. And then when you kind of hear that definition, you're like, oh, I get it. Um, 
from there, and also we are very proud that when um, animators do take training, we are able to provide funding. Um, so because we do understand some people do need to take days off work, they need to do work on their personal time, and we do believe it's important that we um, compensate people for their work. So um, there are some parameters as to who is able to get funding, but we are able to fund many animators throughout the province so that it's basically no cost to them at all. The training is free and they're paid for their time, which is a really exciting thing for, for a lot of people in rural communities. Our second pillar is the network. It's a space to connect and support animators and rural communities during and after training. It enables animators and communities um, a space to learn and advance common issues together. It's an access point for rural communities to participate in other projects, programs, or services um, that are available. And again, what we always say too, as I'm sure everyone is very familiar with, community work is hard work. It takes a lot of time. It is tiring. It's a, it's the long game. And uh, it can be lonely if you don't have a group of support. And so our network is like a community of practice where animators are able to chat with each other, learn from each other, share their own learnings, um, and basically just have that network to say, hey, I don't know where to go from here. How can I do this? And then you have this group of people banding together to help you and cheer you on. Um, you can have that within your local community and then also within that larger provincial community as well. And then thirdly, um, our final pillar, which everybody loves, is we do offer grants to support the implementation of these citizen-led action plans that communities develop together. Um, I'll get into a little more detail a bit later, and hopefully we'll have some time to show you our website where uh, we list these community grants. And now I have to go back this way. <laughs> so what makes rural mental health unique? Why is our approach unique? So our approach is unique as we aim to stay true to our principles. Therefore, we do not provide a checklist to communities and our training is not prescriptive. We do not parachute into rural communities. And what we mean by that is animators actually have to physically live in that community. They need that local context that I exist here, I live here, I know this community, not necessarily I work here and have this understanding because of the service that I'm under. Um, we do not push a specific program or service, and animators are not trained to be service navigators or urgent care supporters. They're here to be community development practitioners, facilitators, um, and I like to use the word cheerleader. Bringing your community together, focusing on um, what's strong, not what's wrong, and helping get community members excited for all of the opportunity that exists within that community. And then these types of efforts and services are um, the types of efforts and services that service navigators and urgent care supporters provide are offered by other partners. And so we don't enter that space. And so, so far, since we've started, and I think it was 2018, maybe, or maybe late 2017, we have reached around 250 rural residents representing over 150 rural communities in Alberta. So animators have many different roles in their community, as you'll see in this pie chart, um, from first responders, we've got farmers, we have pastors, women's group, and other local change makers as well. What I always like to tell our new animators as they're coming in is like there's no um, education requirement. You don't need to be a social service provider. You do not need to be a mental health professional. You just need to care about your community and want to make a change. And, uh, and we work with you. Um, another piece is that each animator is supported by a local organization. Around 60% of the local organizations that do sign on as backbones are FCSS offices, and the other 40% include NGOs, charities, and Indigenous organizations. And overall, the goal of this support organization is just whoever is best able to support an animator with um, time, effort, and knowledge and experience, depending on what the collective action plan um, speaks to. So our evaluation is supported by PolicyWise, and we've found that our training left animators feeling equipped to identify stakeholders, um, engage citizens, bring action teams together, and facilitate community discussions. And for many animators, they shared that their perspective changed, um, including a broader understanding of mental health and community engagement techniques and next steps. 
And this figure captures the buckets of activities animators engage in after training. So contextualizing training, using the lens and ideas from training in their own community and seeing new possibilities and opportunities, building awareness about their own community, who is in it, what is happening, and what assets are already there, as those often go unnoticed by many people, and then engaging stakeholders, including non-traditional allies and community members, and starting or joining local conversations about community wellness to see how folks can work together. And many then begin co-creating and activating local action plans in their community. And so our network includes many different people and organizations. Animators are at the core as they receive training and funding. It also includes our advisory team made up of people from diverse locations, backgrounds, and who have guided our development and future plans. We've also connected with many local action teams, community organizations, as well as provincial organizations like RPAP to explore how to best collaborate in support of rural Alberta. Um, and so, so far, there are six areas of support for improving rural capacity and wellness as requested from communities. So we partner with others to help increase awareness and reach of existing programs or services. We host animator events to support ongoing um, learning and relationships. Um, and I do believe I was looking at some of the names. I think we might have a few animators on this call. Um, and I believe some of them are coming to our provincial exchange. And so we have an annual conference where we bring all of our animators together to learn from each other and other, um, community development professionals and really get that opportunity to, um, to build their skills and get to know each other even deeper. And then we gather and share resources to help people informed, um, to help keep people help keep people informed in best and emerging practices. We connect people with other communities and organizations based on common interests. We offer different types of support as well. So we have like regional meetups, community coaching, and with our community grants, we've also been able to offer an opportunity to basically workshop your grant idea to make sure that um, you can be as successful as possible in receiving grant funding, as well as making sure you can be successful within your community and you have the skills and capacity and knowledge to, uh, to ensure that um, it's, it's a successful op opportunity. And then we also support shared leadership so that rural communities continue to actively shape how we work. And everybody's favorite section. So our community grants have been running for about four years. We do have three streams of grants that communities can apply for depending on their needs and capacity or experience with grants. And so far we've distribu distributed over $2.2 million to 140 community projects. In 2024 alone, we distribu distributed over 500K to over 25 communities. Um, and so this has just been super exciting. There's been lots of really fantastic activities that have come out with it, um, come out of it. And then on the right, um, there is this pie chart which shows the distribution of community priority areas based on those eight domains I shared earlier on. And so unsurprisingly, especially after COVID, uh, social connections, building well-being, and improving service coordination are the top three priorities during and post-pandemic. And then if you're interested in learning more, getting started or finding out if your community is already involved, you can head to our website, which I will show you in a moment. Um, it offers an interactive map to learn about participating communities. You can also access training with our expression of interest form. So like I shared, um, it is a free training. It's over Zoom. You don't need to drive anywhere. Um, and we provide it three times a year. Um, you also are able to check out our community stories and community grant pages because maybe you don't necessarily have the time or capacity to commit to becoming an animator yourself, but you might be able to participate with the activities already happening in your project, in your community. And then as always, you can always reach out to um, myself or my team if you would like to partner or sponsor communities or again, just get a little bit more information. And then these are our super fun nerdy uh, resources. So I will stop share and go back to the group. I'll pause to see if there are any questions. And I'm also going to pull up um, our website to show some community grants in the meantime. There was a question um, 
just want to clarify the funding for the person's time. Do they consider the funding to support wages for a role? So I think they're asking if you would consider that funding to support a full a full role. Um, but if you'd like to unmute and just clarify that, uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of grants and funding don't support wages. So I just want to be clear because we, we would be happy to expand on one of our positions here at Cartwright Cares to provide some more mental health supports. We particularly work with seniors. And um, there's tons of stuff that we could be doing, but that's always a barrier is, you know, paying for the time. So I just wanted to clarify for that. Yeah, so the tr um, this is where it gets a little complicated because we have kind of like two two areas of funding. So the training funding um, is ba it's basically up to the animator. If there's no animator that is trained in your community, you will be eligible for the training funding. Um, and there's two options at this point in time. There's all either animator compensation or a micro grant option. Um, so in that case, uh, the animator would be able to be paid for their time. In the community grants portion, we do also allow for, I believe, no more than 50% of time um, towards animator wages, um, but we do allow for that to be paid um, for that to be part of the grant request. The way our community grants work as well is um, we do develop an adjudication team of rural community of rural community animators as well as partners from our um, from our advisory team and they help adjudicate the grants. So I'm not able to say 100% the request will be approved immediately, but that is like the uh, the parameter that we have in place is no more than 50% at this time. Um, but we just can be supported. The only point that I would really underscore is again, the Rural Mental Health Project is about funding citizen-led community action plans. Um, we are not in a position to fund service provision. So we've definitely funded people who are community practitioners and they need some extra hours because they're running events, they're running different organizational activities throughout the community. Um, but if somebody were to put in an application and they're trying to get like a mental health professional, we would likely redirect you to another fine uh, funding option. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely gives me gives me just a follow up question. Then um, I'm looking at your grants on the website, and I just yeah. see the time frame is April 2024, January 31st, 2025. But it says closed. So is that a first come first serve basis based on the funding that's available? Or is so that maybe a typo? So our our applications are open between January 1st and January 31st. So that's when we accept our grants. Um, you also, it's also only open to people who take our community animator training. So this is also something that we go through in training to make sure that people are aware of the entire process. Um, but basically, our expressions of interest for grants open in November, I believe. We support communities to help workshop their ideas if they need some support. In January, the grant application opens. And then funding is provided in, I think they get notified in March. You'll have to bear with me because I'm technically not the community grants person, but I worked closely with her. <laughs> um, so I think they get notified in March and then funding is given in April. Um, and then it goes until January 31st. That sounds good. All my other questions, I'll follow up with you individually because I think yeah, this is a sounds great good. Pro program. And we are, as, as mentioned with our principals, we're developmental. Um, and so one of the conversations we are having Originally, it was a 10-month program, um, granting program, just because of our own fiscal year and um, needs, but we are discussing and trying to workshop how we can extend that for communities, because we do understand that 10 months is a very, very quick turnaround, um, and we want to make sure that we're being as supportive as possible to communities. We just have been, unfortunately, unable to find a clean solution at this point in time, but we are working on it. <laughs> Thank you. Jay, did any of that clarify the question that you put in the Q&A as well around uh, what becoming a network partner might look like? Or did you want to continue with that as well? Um, if Tori, if you just want to talk generally for everybody, um, I can reach out to you for me specifically. But if you want to yeah. just describe what that looks like, that'd be great. Thank you. 
Yeah, so there's multiple ways that you can become a network partner, and it's also very open and flexible, which I know is one of those non-answers. Um, but what I would say is kind of like with RPAP, for example, we've been a partner of RPAPs for several years. And what that looks like is RPAP will email us and say, hey, we're doing this event. Can you promote it? And vice versa. Um, we will also provide opportunities for these organizations to speak to our animators, advocate for the services um, and opportunities they provide. And then when relevant, we hope that we're also able to share with your organization um, service users, basically. Other options that are allow, um, that are available is um, joining the network so that you can become part of the adjudication team for community grants, as well as our advisory team. So our advisory team is made up of um, community animators and different service partners um, to help us form and develop and direct our next steps um, for the project. Um, and then of course, though, because uh, most people I imagine here are sitting on nonprofits as well, this is less relevant, um, but obviously we're always will, um, interested to having conversations about sponsor sponsorship and financial partnerships. Um, but generally when it comes to like nonprofit partners, it's usually just that, um, that, uh, relationship of being able to promote and uh, share your opportunities and make sure our animators and our network are aware of it and vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Sorry, I have to hop off. So I really appreciate your, your support and I'll be reaching out. Yeah. And let, I'll put my email in. Oh, I think my email was on that last slide. That's our overall team email, but it's nice and easy, rmh at cmha.ab.ca. And if you also go to the contact form on our website, that goes to that email as well. Awesome, thank you so much. Have a good day. Just, just <laughs> another uh, question that came through to the chat was, how can somebody find a local animator? Yeah, okay. So here, let me share my screen again and show you our lovely website. So as you'll see, this is our lovely website um, and it's just at ruralmentalhealth.ca. If you scroll down here, you see our handy dandy little map. So every little green um, point here is a community that we have a trained animator in. So if you're able to click see all communities, you can scroll through and see what community you're in. So for example, Bonneville, We've got a few Bonnieville, a few animators in Bonnieville. Um, some of these, like Carrie, Andrea, and Gina, I can comment, are associated with the Métis New Dawn region. That's why we have so many animators in Bonnieville specifically. Um, but that is a fantastic way to find our animators. And then again, what you can always do is send us an email or hit this contact form if you're like, I don't have time to look through a map um, and just say, hey, I'm in Leduc, who is my animator? Uh, and then we can let you know about that. I'll stop sharing in case there's more questions. And if there isn't, I can go into our community grants page as well. Yeah, I'm not seeing any more in the chat or the Q&A. Um, so if you want to go ahead, Tori, and again, please just throw your questions in there uh, as they come up. And one thing I also forgot to clarify too, because I know, um, it seems like every organization defines rural differently. So for our organization, we define rural as any community that is not in the seven major centers. So the seven major centers are Fort Mac, Grand Prairie, Edmonton, Red Deer, Calgary, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat. Perfect, there, didn't forget anybody. Um, so other than that, if you don't live in one of those communities, um, you are able to take our training and um, become part of the network. Um, and as well, we are, again, having conversations with our advisory team about whether or not that does kind of explain what uh, we want to do. Like, is that really how we define rural communities? And is that what we wanna continue moving forward with? Um, but I'll share my screen again to show you. So when you're on our website, if you go to this community grants section, first um, you can hit community grants or you can hit the plus sign depending on what you wanna look at. If you go to community grants, it takes you to this one. 
Um, and this will give you an overview and explanation of what our community grants are, who is eligible, the options for your granting streams. Um, but funded projects is a really great one because that's when you're able to see all the different activities that are happening in these communities. You're able to filter by community based off of um, who you want to know. You know, if again, if you live in Cold Lake and you're like, hey, what's Cold Lake up to? Cold Lake has been successful in two different grants. Um, and supporting mental health through play, I believe, is their most recent grant, which was a super cool activity where they developed um, like a natural play space for their community. And um, even the adults have been able to really benefit from this um, outside opportunity, which is awesome. You're also able to filter by um, maybe what you're interested in. Uh, so I know we've got lots of people who are focused on youth mental health. And so you can go to youth and be like, all right, what is going on in rural Alberta about youth? How, who, what are they doing for youth? Who is helping out the youth? And what are some ideas I have? I'm lost for ideas. And you can see what's going on in these communities. Or again, maybe you're moving to a community and you're like, I've got a teenager and they're super mad at me because I'm moving to Manning, Alberta. What is there for them? <laughs> um... And then finally, though I doubt this is probably only one that I use because I manage the website, <laughs> is uh, by year. And so if you're like, hey, that first year, that, you know, second year of community grants, what were people up to? Or if you're like, hey, I'm not really worried about what happened in 2020, what's happening in 2024? And that's when you're able to see like the most recent round of community grants. Another piece on our website that I'll show as well is this get involved. So if you're listening to me talk and you're like, wow, this girl's so funny. I totally want to take training with her. <laughs> you can hit the get involved and go to our animator training page. This breaks down what our animator training looks like, sounds like, feels like, um, how many, uh, how many days you'll be in training, plus our online version, what a community animator is if you forgot. Um, and then from there, you can sign up for training. And this is our expression of interest where we've got listed our training dates that are coming up in 2025. And then you can let us know that you're interested and we'll reach out to you with more information. All right. Well, we're not, I'm not seeing any more questions pop up. So thank you everybody so much for attending. Thank you, Tori, for sharing. Um, I hope that everybody was able to take a little nugget of information away from this session to take back their to their community and and see what can be done to to help support mental health programming out in rural Alberta. Mm -hmm.